Welcome everybody to Digital Analytics Wednesday. Thanks for joining us today. Um, before we go into the presentations, a few words on uh, what Digital Analytics Wednesday is. So it's a volunteer-led group of uh, digital enthusiasts. There's a whole team that has been making these events possible over the past few years. And typically we would be meeting in an office somewhere in the um, central business district in Singapore, but due to COVID situation, we are, have moved online. And uh, the benefit of that is that we can also welcome our audience from Malaysia and Indonesia at the same time. So in case you're joining us from uh, these two countries today, welcome as well to Digital Analytics Wednesday. Um, at this point, I'd also like to highlight our sponsors, Decision Science, eClerks, uh, and Happy Marketer, who have been uh, sponsoring Digital Analytics Wednesday for quite some time now. So thanks uh, very much to our sponsors uh, for making these events possible. Now, um, please do ask questions at the end of each session. Um, we have three sessions for you today, and I'll run you through the agenda shortly. Uh, at the end of each session, you get a chance to win a $50 voucher. All you got to do is um, submit your questions in the YouTube chat. So on, you have next to your streaming video, you have the chat function, and you can submit your questions there. No need to wait till the end of the session. Feel free to post your questions throughout. We will monitor that and then uh, pass them on to the speakers who will be selecting uh, their favorite question for each of the three presentations. Mm. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date um, for the time being, as we don't have any news about the situation uh, and how it's going to develop. We're staying online. So if you uh, want to stay up to date, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then let's look at today's agenda. So we have three great topics and three great speakers with us. Thanks a lot for joining us this evening uh, and allocating your time after working hours to share your knowledge with us. So the first speaker um, who will share her experience and her knowledge is uh, Trish, who heads digital strategy at Happy Marketer. And she has helped brands such as Capital Land, uh, NTC Income, and many more to strategize and orchestrate omnichannel digital marketing solutions that are rooted in data and analytics. So the title of her presentation is The Marketer Who Wears Many Hats, Strategic Thinking for the Modern Marketer. And she will talk in detail about uh, people, process, tech, and how data plays a critical role uh, in a marketer's job. Uh, the next presentation, uh, and we will introduce it in more detail right before the session, um, is by Synchro, who joins us from Mighty Hive. And he will share uh, 10 things that uh, they have learned while working with Google Analytics app plus web. Uh, great topic as well, particularly because a lot of companies are just getting started. So uh, it's great for our audience that we already get to hear uh, from their experience about that topic. And lastly, we have a tech showcase for you uh, by AB Tasty. So Sabrina from, a from the AB Tasty platform. She will share best practices and use cases from clients such as uh, Calvin Klein and Decathlon on how to use experimentation and personalization to optimize uh, digital customer experience. And she will show us in live demo how easy it is actually to, um, to do your tests to uh, bring personalization ideas to life. Then, yeah, welcome to our first speaker. Uh, Trish, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eva. Let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. So as Eva mentioned, you know, thank you so much everyone for joining us. I know everyone has just ended your day, so you must be pretty tired, but I promise you this will be worth it. So my name is Trish and I look after digital strategy at Happy Marketer and we're a data and marketing consultancy. And honestly, it's, it's so nice to be here because for the last year or so, I've been frequenting these door session and I was really excited when the team reached out. So today, uh, as Eva mentioned, Zinko will be talking about the nuances of you know, Google Analytics app plus web and Sabrina will be giving us a demo on personalization and, and her platform. 
But I will zoom out and set the context about why data and personalization is so important in the customer experience by talking about, but by showing you guys what a marketer who wears multiple hats look like. So you guys may have seen some parts of this webinar. Um, you, might, you guys might have seen some part of this uh, presentation in some webinars that Happy Marketer has held. But today's session will be a crystallized and condensed version, which will talk about how we can transform marketing from a cost center into a, into a growth driver and what, the, what is the role that marketing and data play in this. So as we all know, marketing as a function is evolving. And as marketers, we kind of all need to evolve with it. And I think the first thing that we need to do is to evolve our vocabulary. So you might be asking why, but we first heard about this from the CEO of Mercer. So this lady was previously the CMO, and she mentioned that when she used to, to create these reporting decks and she would forward it to her CEO or her boards, and the, the reports had keywords like campaign performance, awareness, brand lift studies, and I'm sure as marketers, we all know that these metrics are really important to us. But her CEO and her CFO either did not understand or did not care about what these uh, meant because there was no dollar value attached to it. So she started to, you know, when she, when she created her report, she started to change the vocabulary that she used. And she started talking about revenue, increasing lifetime value, creating an optimal customer experience, etc. So bear in mind that she did not claim that she would directly drive immediate revenue, but what, what she was saying is that marketing was actually drawing a path to revenue and profitability. Every marketing activity that her team did was tied to a broader business goal. And I think it's so relevant in today's context, right? Because, and, and I'm guilty of this as well as marketers, every day we, we run, we're chasing after a new campaign, we're looking at what our cost per install, what our cost per click is, that we, we tend to forget that we need to show that marketing actually has ROI on business. So this sets the context for the next 30 minutes. And I'm going to be talking about a marketer who wears five different hats. And these hats, you know, media, creative, loyalty, data, and strategy will allow a marketer to move beyond marketing, but will, and, and also influence the entire customer experience. So I will end off the presentation later with a point of view on the silo that exists between advertising and marketing and what we need to do as marketers to start bridging this gap in order to you know, offer our customers uh, that seamless experience that they expect. So do stay on for that. So the first thing I wanna talk about is a marketer who wears the media hat. Now, most marketers get asked this question, you know, where do I find my customers, especially on digital nowadays? So the starting point for media is always the media plan. I'm sure most of you on this call know what a media plan is. It's that large Excel sheet with a lot of rows and columns. And one thing I've come to realize during COVID, especially during COVID, is that presenting media plans on Zoom is an absolute pain. And, and there are just so many rows of numbers, which sometimes even I don't understand. And being forced to do so many of these Zoom presentations has really made me you know, take a step back and to start creating media plans which are understandable to the layman, where you know the kind of the, the depth of um, the research that I've done and the insight that has, has come out from it become evident at a single glance. So I'm gonna show you some examples of work that we've done for our clients. So for example, a person doing the media plan needs to know which channels their customers are using. So for example, a brand in the travel industry, you need to know where your customers are spending your time, their time on. Is it on travel influencers, uh, videos on YouTube or on Instagram, or are they on travel sites like BBC Travel or Lonely Planet? Then, you know, the media planner needs to identify how much of this budget actually goes into each of these platforms based on assumptions or based on data that you have. And the next thing is to identify which countries are a priority for you. So many times I've spoken to a brand, you know, and they have limited budgets to spend on media. The first exercise that we do with them is always on prioritization. So which country ranks high from a business priority standpoint and how much or how much revenue do each of these countries bring in? And I think that this is super critical because not every country will have the same prioritization or attention. And, you know, planning this out will really help you um, better align the budget uh, spent to the ROI that you want to achieve. And the last is a visualization of how media budgets have been split according to different parts of the funnel. So for example, if let's say a platform like Bumble, so the social networking app, they're trying to acquire more female users. It might make sense to focus more on the 
uh, more of the budgets on awareness campaigns with specific messaging to change the perception about, you know, dating apps being sleazy and, and shift it more towards about establishing real connections. And this will subsequently make acquisition budgets work harder for you as well. And beyond the media plan, when we talk about media, there's always talk about testing and learning. And I'm sure most of you have heard test and learn so many times, either from your agency or from your client. But how many of us actually knows, uh, or how many of us actually have these clear hypotheses to test and know actually which tests to prioritize? So this is a sample of a testing framework that we actually created for a client. If you look on the left, we've identified a list of tests based on channel and type. So, you know, whether you are testing the, the audience segment or whether you're testing the creative format or the messaging. And we map this, uh, we map all these hypotheses against an effort impact matrix. And what this does is it helps us prioritize tests which can result in quick wins for the business with lesser effort. So to summarize what a marketer who wears the media hat must do, I believe that you know, we really must be able to articulate clearly the impact of our budget on the channels, the countries, and each stage of the customer journey to show that you know, media actually has ROI on the business. So if we look at the next head, which is the creative head. So as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about media and personalization, the next thing, the next question that a marketer has on his or her mind is always a question about what can I say to excite, engage, or convert these prospects? And when we talk about creatives, well, at least for me previously, I, I always think that, you know, there's some creative director out there who randomly gets a brilliant idea. And this brilliant idea is then being translated into, you know, a huge campaign with stunning key visuals. But I think what we don't realize is that the creative process is actually really strategic. And it's important to keep human psychology in mind when we talk about creatives. So, you know, beyond the kind of message that your brand wants to push out, um, any form of output or targeting to, to a particular audience has to cater to either the left or the right brain of a customer. So how do you connect with them on both a logical and an emotional level? And I think this is particularly re relevant because if you look at the world of behavioral economics, you know, we like to think of ourselves as logical buyers, but honestly, we're in so many ways emotional buyers. And the other thing that as brands we need to solve is that if we, if we just look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you, you need to begin at the bottom, you know, solving for the physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem, and, you know, even self-actualization needs. And as a business, you have to ask yourself exactly what need you're solving. And based on that, as you can see in the screenshot on the right, brands then create different creatives, different advertisements that have different kinds of messaging. And I think especially in times like COVID, we, we, we really need to solve, we might need to solve for physiological or even safety needs. And these are just some of the many considerations that creative folks actually go through to come up with a particular creative campaign. So the creative outputs from this planning and strategic thinking could be, you know, presented in multiple formats. So it could be static images in the form of banners. It could be TVCs, which are still pretty popular nowadays. It could be vertical video ads on TikTok or Instagram or even GIFs. And from an agency or an in-house business perspective, creative outputs are the function of three core strategic elements. So there is someone looking at the creative thinking. So this person is very strategic and, and ties you know, the creative output to the business direction and plan, and even how the brand wants to position itself or communicate to its customers. Then you would have the folks who you know, express this form of thinking through copywriting and through design. And the reason why this is so important for people who are not familiar with the creative process is that, you know, we tend to think of creativity as random, but there's actually a lot of science and art and even strategic thinking that goes into this. So I'm going to share some of my favorite um, create, uh, creatives that I've seen uh, in the last few years. And I think that, you know, they are true to their brand. Sometimes they're even controversial. And, you know, the power of simplicity and copywriting really, really comes through. So if you look at the one on the left, it's an ad by the Health Education Council. And the whole ad is essentially just a simple word of no. The byline says, um, still the most effective form of birth control. 
And you know, I, I think this was in a magazine or on a billboard, but can you imagine how powerful it is? It, is, it grabs your attention because there's just one word of no, and it really drives home the point. Now, the middle ad is also one of my favorites. Um, it's from L'Oreal. And if you see an ad from L'Oreal, you, you would typically think it's for women because their products are catered mostly to women. But the messaging actually says this is an ad for men. And it brings awareness to how more leadership positions should be open for women. And I personally thought it was so smart because it's the, the image is so contradictory to the copy, right? Lipstick, but it says that the ad is for men. So this was one of my favorite. And the last one is a cheeky ad by Durex, which says to all those who use our competitor products, happy Father's Day. So these three ads are you know, either really powerful, really attention grabbing or really cheeky. And I think that they remain top of mind in their customers. So if I were to summarize um, the, the creative head, you know, with data driven being such a um, loosely used jargon today, there's a misconception that, you know, with data and tech in place, we don't need creatives or creatives can take a back seat. But on the contrary, I think that, you know, while creative is subjective, it's, it's honestly a brand can wield it to change perception. A brand could use it to disrupt norms and even uh, set the course of how the brand would eventually evolve over the decades. Now, the, the next hat is the loyalty hat. So now that we know where to find our customers, um, how to communicate with them, how can we make them fall in love with us? So marketing is, is kind of a lot like dating, isn't it? <laughs> We've met someone, you know, we understand how they respond to certain situations and now we need to make them fall in love with us. So let's see what a marketer who wears the CRM hat need to do. So when we talk about loyalty, um, I'm sure all of you have heard uh, some, some terms being thrown around. So there's CRM, email marketing, marketing automation, and, about, and how you know, these three together can help you nurture and retain your customers. Now, but for the, you know, for the sake of setting the context in the next few slides, I just want to take some time to quickly define each component. So CRM is essentially technology that lets you manage your customer database. And ideally, it should give you that single view of your customer. So all the interactions that they've had with your brand, um, their preferences, their contact information should all be easily visible to you. And some common platforms in the market are Salesforce CRM or HubSpot CRM. Now, email marketing is something that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, typically refers to batch and blast, which means you send the same email to everyone with no customization to the content. And the last one is marketing automation, which is the more advanced version of email marketing, where instead of just emails, you are actually able to run and manage only channel campaigns. So think about not only emails, but SMSs, push notifications, digital advertisements, for example. And you can actually build these automated journeys on one single platform. So we'll talk a little bit about this later, but some common platforms in the market include Salesforce Marketing Cloud, Adobe Campaign, Marketo, which was acquired by Adobe, and you know, Oracle's uh, responses and Eloqua. So with all these in mind, how do we know which platform to use or you know, even where to begin? So I think it all comes down to de really developing a customer strategy. Now, customer strategy, and I'm sure most of you will agree with me, is, is one of the buzzwords that everyone hears and uses, but we all find it incredibly difficult to deploy. So what is customer strategy? So if you do a quick Google search, it, I can tell you what Google will say. It could be you know, segmentation. It could be a uh, customer experience strategy, media strategy, or even brand communication strategy. Or it could be a combination of one or two or all of these. But you know, while technically none of these terms are incorrect, Individually, they only provide a partial definition. So how I would define customer strategy is a data-driven approach to maximizing the financial value of customers. And this can be done by combining a deep understanding of you know, your customers' needs, their behaviors, the value uh, and their value with, you know, and you combine that with the ability to engage them in, an, in the optimal way at various touch points across um, you know, the entire relationship that you have with them. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when you buy a shampoo, when you're buying a bottle of shampoo, you probably go through four to five different touch points before you decide to buy. So for example, you see an ad, you visit the website and you visit the store and then perhaps you buy it online because it's more convenient. But what about services like opening a bank account? 
it's it's not as simple as buying a bottle of shampoo, you know, from the shelf. And in fact, I've seen studies which shows that, you know, customers take anywhere between 60 to 100 touch points before converting. Because it requires a lot of, you know, research into the bank itself, into the types of products it offers, and whether it's the right fit or not. And this means that the bank, which is present on most of these touch points, serving the right message at the right time, will likely be the bank of choice for the customer. So now that we've covered what customer strategy is, let's look at the different stages of maturity when it comes to um, the activation of this customer strategy and how we can get from the very initial stages of maturity, which is one to all very limited communications to personalized one to one interactions all the way at the other end of the maturity curve. Now, the first thing you will do here is one to all messaging. And I believe that, you know, no brand can skip this step. If you're just getting started on retention activities, you are not magically going to be able to um, create personalized messages for all your customers. If you try, it's going to take a lot of time and energy. And even if you're just customizing messages for 50 people, it doesn't leave you with much time for real work. So one to all messaging is a nice place, you know, to be between doing something and actually seeing results. Um, it's not ideal, but it does get things going. And the tech that you need for this is just an email platform. So something as simple as MailChimp will do. And honestly, for some brands, it's even okay if, if they remain at this stage because people just need to hear from them once in a while to, to remember that they exist. Now, you will need to move to the next stage when you start dealing with many more contacts in your database. So the next stage is when you start doing optimized campaigns and you need to do that when, you know, suddenly your contact database grows from the hundreds into the thousands. So, you know, for maybe 10 people, you can definitely send manual notes, but you certainly can't do that as you approach a thousand and beyond. And then suddenly it becomes important to have a CRM platform. And if your business is in the B2B world, you anyways would want a CRM system because your deal management processes will see a huge improvement when you move from, let's say, an Excel or to something like a Salesforce or a Pipedrive, which are honestly great CRM platforms. So the next stage that a marketer can get to is actually when you have enough skill to form segments. So let's say now you've gotten to that size where you have thousands of people in your database and you'll find that these people are very different from each other. So it could be their age, it could be their buying behavior, what kind of products they use, the level of engagement that they have with you. And all these things can actually help you create very different segments. And at that size, you can actually afford to spend a little bit more time doing um, segmented messaging. And the wonderful thing about moving up to this stage is that there is technically no new tech investment required because every email platform and CRM system can handle segments to a certain extent. You know, they can, they, they can um, do multiple messages, they can, they can create sequences. And I would say that the investment is actually more on the time and the people and the process that, that you invest in. And so if you're just getting started with one, which is, at, which is where you're running static campaigns, I would say that your North Star should be getting to stage three. Big, um, you know, create some segments, start doing some nuanced messaging for different segments. And if you get there, you'll see that, you know, you will be able to read most of the rewards that you can get from, from your database. So if your database starts growing more, or maybe the complexity of your business starts evolving and, and the revenue at play starts growing, then I would say you would need to move up to the next few levels. So after segmentation is automation. So let's say you have, a, um, you have a website. I'm sure most brands out there have a website. And this website is attracting around maybe, let's say, 50,000 people every month. And these people have the expectation that they want to either subscribe to a newsletter, they want to download a white paper, or you've just got these people coming to your website to check what you offer as a brand. So it's very time consuming for you to manually do stuff for them, right? You, you get, so in this case, you want to get automation to work for you. So uh, the basic examples are the first time someone subscribes or gives you their email addresses, um, you don't want to send them messages manually. You want a sequence to apply. So you want them to get a welcome message. You want them to get another email introducing what you sell or offer and, and, you know, ask, and maybe another email to ask them if they have any questions or concerns. Now, similarly, I think one important thing is churn. And having this and enables you to actually um, protect churn or at least deal with it or identify it. 
So if you know that certain customers of yours are interacting less with you, giving you less money, coming back to the website fewer times, then maybe you want to set up some automated um, sequences to remind them to come back or offer them maybe 30 minutes of free consultation. So I, I would say that in this case, if especially if you have a multi-geography product or a multi-segment product, automation is, is a great way to manage your, your database of contacts. Now, the holy grail you want to get to is actually one-to-one -one communication, where you know each and every message is personalized for the user. And you'll see that in most of the e-commerce players that, that, you, that you shop on. So for example, the, a Lazada or a Shopee. And they will do their best to try and you know communicate with you personally so maybe you'll get an m notification but honestly the m notifications are usually pretty generic but you also get notifications about your order history about you know when your order has been placed or when your order is on its way and you, or when your order is arrived and i would say that the brand who has done this absolutely brilliantly is the likes of amazon where you know they customize everything you see, you know, right down to when you first land on the website, what are the, did they show you things based on your past purchases or your past behavior? And even when you look at specific products, they're offering you um, recommended items that you might like. So if I were to wrap up this section, I would say that, you know, for a marketer who is wearing the loyalty hat, it's okay to start with Excel, with Google Sheets, you know, to send some quick emails out. And only when, you know, the business proves itself or when this starts proving itself and is generating extra revenue, then you can start invest, uh, perhaps thinking about investing in uh, another tech platform which will allow you to get to the next step of maturity. Now, the next, step, the next step that we'll talk about is data and personally my favorite one. So in the last few sections, you know, we've talked about constantly, uh, you know, using data to test and learn, using data to build segments or to personalize. But what does that really mean and, and how do we get there? So it all starts and ends with a data roadmap, which will allow you to, you know, really put in place that data foundation and help you activate better on digital media or digital uh, or your digital assets, for example. So I'll take you through each section. And the next few slides will come together to show you what the data roadmap looks like. So step one, you have a website and you're tracking what's going on on the website. Um, you're using maybe tools like Google Analytics, um, Adobe Analytics, and you're also tracking where your traffic came from. So whether it's from ad channels or it's organic or referral channels, for example. Now, if your brand also has an app, you are tracking user behavior within your app and, and where your app installs are coming from. And you're likely using mobile measurement platforms like uh, a Firebase, an AppSlide, or an AppSolo. Now in step two, all of this data, along with the data that you've collected from digital advertising platforms, are actually consolidated into a data warehouse. So we like to call this the marketing data warehouse, and I'll tell you why. So a typical data warehouse in an organization, you know, typically contains uh, sensitive information about customers, and not all of that information might actually be relevant for marketing. So if we want to consolidate marketing data in this particular warehouse for activation, it will create a lot of barriers uh, for marketers from a security and compliance standpoint. You'll probably get a call from your CTO the next morning. So our suggestion is always, you know, to create a separate data warehouse specifically for marketing, which sometimes we like to call the marketing data puddle. So, and it could be, you know, hosted on Amazon Web Services or Google BigQuery or any cloud of your choice. So in step three, on top of all these data collected from um, digital sources, we can also actually feed first party CRM data into the marketing data warehouse. Uh, this will give you a much richer view of your customers. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you're in the retail business, like let's say uh, Charles and Keith, your POS data will be incredibly valuable if you're able to connect it with your membership data and identify you know, what this person or rather what this customer has seen online but purchased offline in stores. And with this kind of data, honestly, the possibilities are endless. You can, you can activate them on social media, you can activate them on digital media or even on your website. So we can also, so based on all of this data that's being consolidated in the, in the warehouse, we can actually create a data strategy based on, you know, what kind of data sources you have, what kind of integrations are required for your systems to talk to each other. And we can visualize this data on dashboards. And it could be purely for, you know, for reporting or for business intelligence purposes. So I will show you some, I'm going to show you some sample dashboards that we've created for our client. Um, 
Okay, the first one you see here tracks uh, app and media performance. We're able to see, you know, uh, daily active users, monthly active users, and we can actually compare this performance against past weeks or months. So very basic uh, dashboard that tracks activity on the app. Now the sample on the right is actually one of the most critical visualizations that we've done for a global bank. And this is to help them measure the performance of their digital only banking app. So the data here is just dummy data, but it showcases the conversion rate from one stage of the funnel to another. And this is especially important when we're having conversations with the clients because app installs are no longer enough, even for a marketer as their KPIs, but the marketer's KPIs have now become, how can we get people to go through this lengthy know your customer KYC process, open an account and fund that account. And with this clear view, with this, with, with this clear view of you know, where people are dropping off, what are the pain points in each stage of the funnel, we're, able actually, uh, we're actually able to optimize each stage of the funnel uh, in an agile manner. And we can actually increase the conversion rates uh, for each stage. So beyond visualizations and dashboards, um, there are also some things that we can do by, you know, by creating audiences and segments based on uh, rules that we have defined with the business. And we can prep them for activation on media or on own channels. Now, the more data you feed into your data warehouse and the more tests you run, we are, you are actually able to create clusters of audiences based on machine-based segmentation. So a great example is something that uh, we did for one of our airline clients. So typically, or at least for me, I would never think that, you know, someone who chooses window seats are more likely to purchase front row seats. But that's actually what we discovered by going through our customers' data. And we actually started showing advertisements to purchase front row seats to customers who already have a window seat. And what this uh, resulted in was an, a large increase in revenue, in, uh, in ancillary revenue for the client. And beyond this, you know, we can also conduct more advanced analysis, such as um, the recency frequency monetary analysis. This is a favorite one uh, for a lot of our clients, where we actually identify different groups of customers based on how recent they've purchased, how frequently they, they purchase, and how much do they purchase at any given time. And we can also identify, you know, who are your champions, uh, people who absolutely love your brand and constantly comes back, or, you know, potential loyalists, people who um, have the same behavior as your champions, but have not exactly become a champion. And based on that, we can decide on what action to take. So for example, if you were grab, you would likely give a discount to someone who is who could potentially become a platinum member versus someone who is already a platinum member. Because why would we want to um, give a discount to someone who anyways use our service? So based on these kind of analysis that we do and the segments that we create, we can then activate them on paid and own channels, depending on what your end objective is. And the goal of all of this, and I know it's a very abused uh, jargon, which is you should be able to get a single view of your customer, basically understanding them enough to show them personalized messaging on different digital channels. So to end off this section, uh, what I strongly believe is that a marketer who wears the data hat should approach marketing from the right to the left, where you know we start with a vision of how we're going to achieve that single view of the customer. We actually take time, invest time and people and processes into building this data foundation that will enable this. And then we use the insights that we get to activate digital marketing initiatives in a personalized and effective manner. So the last hat that I wanna talk about is strategy. And instead of telling you what strategy is, uh, that there's just too many webinars out there about that. I wanna use this section to some, basically summarize the four hats that we've discussed in the last 20 minutes and how they contribute to shaping up into um, you know, a customer experience. So when we talk about customer experience, I think we need to start with demystifying all the jargons and, we, and let's start uh, with two very basic terms. So advertising tech, which is ad tech and marketing tech, which is smart tech. Now, when we talk about ad tech, uh, we think about advertisements. So for most marketers, we after we start running advertisements, um, the conversation starts evolving into testing multiple different creatives and messaging. That's what I mentioned earlier. So which one is working better than the other? And for some marketers, we're actually able to progress to the next level of maturity and we start looking at DCO, so dynamic content optimization. We start personalizing our digital media. 
But if you look at these two activities, they mostly fall into the realm of paid media. Now, more mature marketers are actually able to progress to the next stage where we actually start A-B testing not only on our ads, but also on our owned assets. So for example, people start testing on their websites, on their landing pages, uh, you know, what is the order of content that they show people on their homepage based on their behavior, or they test different creatives and messaging on the hero banner, or sometimes even something as granular as testing different colors of your call to action button. And throughout this exercise, um, I think marketers realize that, okay, we should, we should start testing specific variants for a very specific persona of, of uh, potential customers. And the result is that conversion rates should be higher. And this is where people start talking about personalization. And I'll tell you, in my experience, different agencies and different brands will have absolutely different definitions of what personalization is. But the key underlying theme is that it should not just be on media, but it should also be on your website, on your social media, on your app. Because when, you know, when we are personalizing it, it should be a seamless experience. So I, I don't know about you guys, but there's been so many times when I click on an ad and, I, and the landing page that I land on looks completely different and it just throws me off. It doesn't even look like it belongs to the same brand. So, you know, this happens more often than not. And that consistency when you're personalizing the different assets that you own so it, it needs to extend beyond media but also goes going into your own assets so around this stage of maturity uh, marketers start maxing out their avenues around personalization so most of us are actually being forced to think beyond marketing channels uh, and we're now forced to think about things like customer service how do i make sure that my existing customers who call in uh, get a consistent experience with what they see online about our brand. So how do I ensure that, and this is an important one, that I don't reach out to customers who are already unhappy with our service with a marketing promotion. So this is where, you know, we start thinking beyond marketing and into service and sales. So this is where we really need to look at how we're dealing with existing customers, what problems they have, how we can help to prevent churn. And this is something that extends beyond advertising and can only be uh, enabled by marketing technology. So if you look at the same frame on the slides, I can actually divide this into two different uh, pockets. So the lower half of the screen is what a marketer cares about, it's marketing. And the upper half of the screen goes beyond marketing into sales and service. And if I slice this up even further, what you see on the bottom of the first two or three blocks, that's advertising technology. And what you see at the top is MarTech. And precisely because it's being split in this way, the problem that happens is that a silo is, a silo is actually being created here. And this creates some problems. So firstly, um, when we talk about MarTech and EdTech, to manage these two things requires people with very different skill sets. And if we look at how things are being done currently in our industry, most of the times as a brand, you would end up working with different agencies for advertising and for marketing. And even as a brand within your own organization, these two buckets are owned by very different teams, very different stakeholders who have very different objectives and KPIs. So this forces organizations to, you know, not only leverage data, but more than that, it forces changes on the people and the process side of things as well because we need to now make sure that business and technology collaborate together in the same organization. And I'm sure most of you on this call has at some point gone through the challenge of trying to make marketing work with IT. And honestly, it is a pain. And you know, changing this dynamic and changing how people work will require mindset changes. And what we've seen is that marketers can actually be a catalyst in encouraging this change. And we've seen it in some of our clients. So, you know, and, and one thing that, you realize when you start trying to fix this silo is that this is actually the starting point of most digital transformation projects. So I will take you guys through how we can actually integrate ad tech and martech, but because we don't have enough time, uh, but not to worry, we actually, well, Happy Marketer actually has a webinar with Salesforce and Google on this exact topic. Uh, you can find the recording on our website or just drop me a message after this uh, session and I'll be happy to share it with you. And before I end, I just wanted to leave you guys with this meme. I actually just saw this on LinkedIn today and I thought I should add it to the deck. Um, essentially, I think that the message here is that as marketers, let's not get carried away or get enamored by, you know, the latest, fanciest platforms out there. 
But we really need to start thinking more strategically from the customer's point of view. So I've come to the end of my section and I hope this gets you guys thinking about, you know, what is the next step for you as a marketer in, in this journey to actually providing the seamless customer experience that everyone is talking about. So I'm happy to be connected over LinkedIn or email. Feel free to reach out to me and I believe we will start on Q&A now. Thanks so much, Trish, for the presentation. That was really insightful. And uh, I particularly like the cartoon in the end. <laughs> that really made me <laughs> smile just now. <laughs> That's a great one. Okay, so we, um, with the online um, version, there's a slight delay in the streaming. So we are waiting for questions to come in. In the meantime, sure. um, I have a few questions to kick off from the DOS team. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first question is, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge for marketers to shift their focus from metrics that are um, more around campaign awareness, brand lift, web visits, and so on, towards metrics that actually monitor profits, growth, customer lifetime value? Right. So I think that's a great question. Um, and to be honest, I've been having these conversations with a lot of my clients in the last couple of months. So the biggest challenge, honestly, it's not around the kind of platforms that's available in the market or around the kind of tech that we must have, but it's actually around mindsets and people. So when we're talking about changing um, our vocabulary from, let's say, campaign awareness to profits or to growth, oftentimes a marketer feels that we don't have enough control to directly impact those metrics. And therefore, you know, we stick to what we're comfortable with, which is uh, CPI, CPR, for example. But I think this change needs to really happen top down, where the CMO needs to start talking in this language as well. Because I think when the CMO starts thinking about marketing from a business ROI, from a business growth, or even a revenue perspective, it trickles down into the teams. And when we're looking at digital campaigns, like let's say if we're looking at a Facebook campaign, a lead generation campaign, while it's important to have that media plan, to have that campaign report, which shows you how many clicks did you get, how many leads did you get, it's also important to do a larger report which zooms out and look, and look at, you know, out of these um, X number of leads that has been driven by my Facebook lead generation campaign at how many of these actually uh, converted into a customer. And also to really look at the process between a lead uh, and a customer, because a lot of the times that's where uh, people tend to drop off. It's easy to get leads. Honestly, if you have media money, leads are easy to acquire, but converting them is really where the challenge appears. So I would say it starts at the top with the CMO and the vocabulary change has to be socialized within the internal teams. Great, thank you. Uh, then the next question is around segmentation. What's your recommendation? Mm. How can we strike a balance between um, being too granular and having too, a, a too small audience or on the other side between being too broad and being inefficient in terms of targeting? How can one-on-one -on -one targeting work at scale? Yeah. I think that's also a really good question. So when we talk about segmentation, I know it's a buzzword and everyone thinks that we should be doing segmentation. But at the end of the day, if you are a small business and if you have a product that you know is, is pretty common amongst the different kinds of people who want to apply for it, there might not necessarily be a need for segmentation. You could perhaps just tweak a couple of emails that you send out based on you know, what you already know about the customer. But there's really no need to dive deep and say that, okay, I need to personalize my message to each and every one of them. But on the other hand, if you are a brand that has a wealth of data, let's say if you're, if you're in e-commerce or if you're in FSI, then I think that there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunities there for you to maybe not do one to one targeting if we're not talking about you know someone that you already have their data of um, but there's a lot of opportunities for you to show messages that that would resonate with them based on what they prefer or what their behavior is and I know uh, then there will be concerns around creepiness so if you're showing this if you're doing one-to-one -one personalized marketing and in the and the messages start coming so frequently and and it's so personalized to me does the customer get creeped out so the answer is yes, maybe they do, but the solution is simple. Uh, frequency capping. A good frequency capping uh, strategy actually helps remove a lot of that creepiness out of it. So I would say 
segmentation might not be for everyone, but if you have the if you have the volume of data and if you have the insights that come with it, personalization can really help you, um, you know, increase sales, increase revenue. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in particular in a question around um, advertisers that have very long uh, purchase journeys. Mm -hmm. So if you work with advertisers like that, um, where purchase journeys are several months uh, in, in some cases, what's mm -hmm. your advice typically for these type of advertisers um, who are using data in their strategy? Right. Yes. Okay. So we have a lot of experience with that. So I think one good industry to talk about would be education, especially from a business school standpoint. Um, so as, as all of you know, you know, the journey to getting in, to even deciding to get an MBA and then actually registering and getting into an MBA school is, uh, is a long one. It could take anywhere between 24 to 36 months. And from an advertiser standpoint, it's, it does not make sense to bombard this person with advertisements for the whole 24 to 36 months uh, of their journey. So what's really important here is that we actually recommend a nurture strategy using a marketing using using marketing automation platforms. So you use advertising to first capture the data of these people, get them interested in your business school, and then once you have that data, come up with a nurture strategy based on uh, based on their profile. So for example, um, uh, for example, in Seat, right, they have many different. Uh, they have they have a lot of different programs and not every prospect would be interested in an MBA course. They could be interested in an EMBA course, for example. So the idea is first, the first layer of segmentation has to be what ha which course has this prospect um, indicated an interest for. And then based on that, depending on where they are at their journey, if let's say they have not taken the test required to sign up for an MBA, we send them maybe an article about five tips to ace um, the test. Or for people who've already gone through the test, successfully passed it then, and they're at the end of their consideration journey, a message about why INSEAD is the best business school should be sent to them. And you can do all this in an automated fashion using a marketing automation platform like a Salesforce or an Oracle or an Adobe. So I would recommend that media is only used at the beginning and perhaps at the end to just remain top of mind and to get their data. But in the middle, the nurture strategy using marketing automation is very critical. Thanks a lot for the great recommendation. Um, two more questions for you, uh, and then yeah. we need to finish uh, the Q&A. So there is one question from uh, Sean. It's around uh, privacy. And he wanted to understand your point of view on uh, data-driven customer strategy, especially with the increasing concerns around privacy, particularly from an agency standpoint. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, yes, as an agency, we face this um, problem every day when we're speaking to clients about data privacy and, and, and compliance. I think the key to that is um, two things. So the first one is internally, it's important for agency teams to have very strict um, data uh, processes and regulations in-house. So for example, if as an agency, we're handling our customer data. We need to ensure that, you know, the right firewalls are in place. The right people in the agency have access to that data. And maybe every month or every two months, we need to relook at who has access to switch out that access. So having that documented really reassures the clients on many levels. And the second thing I would say is that um, being able to... Uh, maybe guide the clients on how they can do most of the data handling and processing on their side so that when the data comes to us, it's, um, it's hashed. So we wouldn't, know, we wouldn't know that user ABC is Trish, but we only know that user ABC does, uh, maybe user ABC like sports, has clicked on X number of buttons on our website. And based on that, we can do whatever activation and processing we need on our end and we can always send this data back to the client where they can process it in their own environment and they can, and obviously they can make sense of the fact that user ABC is Trish. So I would say two different things. One is internal and one is externally helping clients navigate this, uh, especially our marketing clients, navigate this kind of data privacy conversations with their own IT and security teams. 
And the last question is about uh, testing methodologies for A and B tests, uh, especially around hate media. So do you have any recommendation for someone who is getting started on this uh, for period, budget, size? How do you judge what's necessary? Hmm. So I think this is a very broad question, but if I could just, um, if I could just break it down, I would say that uh, testing can come in multiple forms. So you can either test the type of audience segments that you have. So, you know, especially when we start running paid media campaigns, right? Maybe our creative agency does some research and they say that, okay, this particular type of audiences would resonate better with this particular type of messaging. So we can always do that test. So maybe uh, when we first start running our, our ad campaigns, we show the same creative to five different audience segments. Based on that, based on who reacts better to which ad format, we can then tweak the rest of the campaigns. Um, the second thing could be around testing the... Um, the creative formats. So some people might respond better to video ads, but some people might respond better to display ads. Because for example, if I'm constantly on the move, video ads don't make sense for me. Um, I won't be able to view it or I won't have the attention span to view it. But if you show me a display ad while I'm browsing on a, on a website while I'm on the bus, you know, that might catch my attention and might cause me to actually click on the ad. And the third thing I would say we can test on um, could be different types of uh, targeting strategies. So we can always um, test with, let's say, the existing, either the existing first party data that you already have, or we can always look for, you know, third party um, data vendors, which have data that could help us enrich the, the data that we already have on a user level. And you can then test, you know, different kinds of creative messaging, different kinds of uh, strategies on them. So I would say it's pretty, uh, I know it's, it's not a very detailed answer and it's not specific to paid media, but if I could just break it down for you now, considering that we don't have much time, this would be what I recommend. Thank you so much. Then I'd like to ask you to choose a winning question. So there's two eligible questions. Uh, the yeah. one was about privacy and the other one was the testing methodology. Thanks, Eva. Um, I think I would go with Sean's question because... I, I do think that as an agency, especially as an agency in these times, like data privacy and concerns are the main thing that clients, you know, speak to us about when we're talking about any projects when it comes to data and analytics. So yeah, I really like Sean's question and I think it's really relevant. Great, thank you. Uh, then congrats to Sean. We will reach out to you about the voucher. And now I'm handing over to Hari. So thanks again, Trish, for your presentation. Thanks, Eva. And Harry will introduce the next session. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Trish. That was a great session. Uh, and loving the way our topics are interconnected today, right? We had Trish speaking about roles of marketeer, and we have uh, Zinco, who will double click into one of that hat, data, and one of the platform that's commonly used to access data. And we have Sabrina from AB Testy following this session, speaking about how do you quickly run AB tests. So that's interesting. So yeah, without further ado, uh, next topic would be on Google Analytics web and app property that was recently launched. And our speaker would be Zinco from Mighty Hive. So Zinco has eight plus years of experience on web analytics and digital analytics. And he would be sharing his learnings on the recent uh, web plus app property that was launched by Google Analytics. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Zinco. Uh, Over to you. Yeah, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Um, one minute. Can you see us? Well, let me try to share again. Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Hi. Thank uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a bit weird to talk virtually like this. Uh, normally, I will be um, in the event, uh, uh, but it's good to have the uh, audience from other countries as well. So this is actually a great speaking experience for me. So for today's agenda, uh, I will just talk a little bit more about me, uh, like um, who am I, uh, wh where am I working at? And, and then I would uh, jump straight into talking about App Plus Web. Uh, this is an exciting release. Uh, we, we, can, we can even see like Google Analytics next version. And then what are the learnings about it uh, that we get from using this tool for like a, a couple of months already? And then a recap. 
So uh, just a little bit about me. So I am, uh, my name is Zinko. I'm originally from Myanmar. I am working in Singapore about 12 years, uh, yeah, 11 or 12 years. And then I have uh, been working in digital analytics field for, for about seven or, uh, seven or eight years. I've been working in both client side and agency side, um, and mostly around uh, digital analytics, web optimization, and then consulting. Um, so I am currently working at Mighty Hype, with the uh, data and digital media agency who let Marketa take control. So we have the brand, we have to bring the brands together to achieve uh, using their data, find the like signals in the noise, and then activate on based on these insights. So these are our expertise. So we start with all the uh, like usual uh, as a data analytic agency, we uh, we advise the clients on their data. We build the infrastructure for them. We handle uh, implementation work like analytic work such as Appless Web. Uh, we also work with the uh, client uh, marketing team to activate the media, advise, advising them on how to use data to run the marketing campaigns and then how can they monetize the data that they have. So this is a little bit more about me and money have in general. So I will jump straight into talking about Appless Web. So what is Appless Web? So before I go into Appless Web, I will briefly want to talk a bit about like a uh, history of Google Analytics that we know so far. So Google Analytics really started around 2005 when they acquired Urgent uh, Company. It's, uh, it's used to call as Urgent Tracking Code. Uh, as a fun fact, like you might be familiar with the word called UTM parameters. So these UTM parameters actually came from this um, Urgent Company. So, um, so this is like a, a bit of throwback. Uh, they are still using the UTM parameters nowadays to tag the campaigns, etc. So it, it came from the Urgent Company. And then around 2009, uh, Google Analytics started with the classic Google Analytics uh, GA.GS code. So this is to track the uh, websites and the web pages online. And then around 2012, Google started with the uh, Universal Analytics, which is the Analytics GS. So it has a bit more features, uh, a bit more and has an enhancement in the feature and data collection. And then uh, 2016, they launched a paid version of Google Analytics called Analytics 360, uh, used to go as Google Analytics uh, Premium. And then uh, 2017, uh, they launched, uh, they not launched, but they acquired Firebase. So, and then they uh, launched a Firebase separately for ads around, uh, basically you can then use Firebase to uh, track the users and then uh, behavior on the ads. And then 2019 and today, they have uh, launched this new product called App Plus Web. Essentially, from the graphic, as you can see, it is the combination of app data and web data uh, rolling into one. So, right now at the moment, as you can, if you go into Google Analytics and then if you uh, if you are already using Google Analytics, you might be familiar with two products. So, one is the Google Analytics, the, the main product that we know. So, this exists in website analytics. So, it has the free version GA or it has the paid version GA360. So, it it offers all the uh, features that allow you to track the users uh, and user behavior on the website. And then uh, if you are using paid version, Google Analytics 360, it offers you more robust reporting, right? So you can have more reports, more custom dimensions and metrics. And then there's a Firebase. So the Firebase is mostly designed for apps. So it is uh, full app analytics, but you don't have to pay for anything. Uh, it's a free to use. And then you can scale it uh, using Firebase as your business group. There are like certain paid tier if you reach certain uh, limit and then you want to get more features out from Firebase. So it's like uh, you can get uh, even even level reporting with no hit limit. You can see all data coming from your apps uh, in your Firebase project. And then it's very simple to set up and it's very simple to you know like uh, look into there and set it up and go into report. But then at the same time, it's very powerful because it offers a lot of uh, out of the box features that uh, are not going to be available with other mobile and app analytics too. So, yeah, these are the two main tools. And then now we have a new uh, tool called Google Analytics App Plus Web. So we can call it as a, like a next generation of Google Analytics GA version two. So it com what it essentially does is that it combines the uh, measurement of your website plus your measurement of the app. So you can then now analyze the user in a single property. And then because of that, it has the new data model, which I will be going through a bit more. And then it offers you a lot more pre-built report, like analysis hub, cross-perform analysis, and, and so on. So it's much more uh, better uh, in a way that you will be, then be able to see the uh, your user single user across different properties, website or the app. It also offer like additional enhancements such as automatic measurement of, say, for example, scroll, downloads, uh, exit click, etc. Um, so 
and then it's a beta product. So it, it, it has recently been launched. So it will be like releasing a lot more features along the way. So, so what did we learn, right? So we have been playing around with Atlas Web uh, and then we have been implementing Atlas Web for a couple of our clients and uh, around past six months so, six months so. So these are the things that we learned. This is not a comprehensive list. And then in a uh, process of timing, I cut down the list to like a lot of uh, learnings and I cut down like top five, top six learnings that I found so far. And then hopefully you find something useful in there and then you want to try out Atlas Web. So the first thing I want to talk about is a new data model. So uh, if you are familiar with Google Analytics, you may notice that uh, in your current Google Analytics model, we always go three level, right? So you have the user level where you can track the user by the cookie, or if you're Firebase, you can track the user by the, uh, the uh, devices and so on. So the user, and then the user come to the site and then it will form a session, right? So 30 minute sessions. So based on the cookie, so they will come to the site, we can count the number of sessions or number of visits as we call it. So inside, each session, you can have a page view or you can have an event. So page view is when the user start viewing the page and then the event is how the, when the user start interacting with the uh, page content and so on, right? And then when we move into App Plus Web model, everything has changed. So there are no more sessions, but instead, and then there are no more page views and events, everything has become event. So think of it as like a, you are tracking the single user and then when they come to the, your App Plus Web property, everything that they do can be considered as event. So your page view is an event, your normally the your interaction can be also triggered event. So, so just to give you a bit of example, this is our Mighty Hive site. And then if say for example, in uh, if if we want to track this carriers button on our commonly dropdown, and then normally in Google Analytics model, we will track with you know like event tracking. Uh, so you will define like event category where be your top navigation, event action will be clicked, even label will be the name of the button, so on, which is the carriers. And then you can also add your own custom dimension. So something like page type will be the home page, right? And then of course in Google Analytics, there is only when you land on the site, you are going to fire a page view tag, which is the home page page view. But oh sorry. And then when we move into App Plus Web Data Model, what happened is that instead of page view event and um, click event, you are going to fire two events now. So one is the button click event, and that is to stay track the uh, the click of the button. And another one is you will fire the page view event. So there are two events now, and then everything around like you won't have the names of like event category, even actually event label anymore. Everything has become parameter. So one parameter was set up as like a button location, and then they, this will give you the name of the like where the button is located, and then action etc. So as you can see, it is it's uh, similar, but it is slightly different in a way like the way you think about how you attract the uh, all these. Uh, interactions and page them on the site. And it's actually good because uh, now with App Plus One model, you are thinking more as a user and a user using an app instead of user going to the website, right? So there is no concept of say like viewing a page in an app. It's more like event, right? The user can click through the skit, click through the screen, uh, view the screen. These are all events that user can do. So this is why App Plus One model is now, data model is purely based on Firebase app reporting model, which is everything can be considered as an event. And these are the parameters that you can track with it. So, and then another point about App Plus Web is that the concept of data streams. So if you're familiar with Google Analytics, normally when you want to implement a Google Analytics, you will have like some kind of like property or UAID that you want to place on your website. Uh, or like in your, if you're using GTA, you want to place it in a GTA. So you will have your own web ID for your website. And then if you're using Firebase, you will have your own Firebase project for your iOS or Android app, right? So these are like separate. But then uh, with App Plus Web, everything can be combined into one. So for example, uh, as you can see from my screen, I have a data stream set up for my uh, personal website. And then you can add your iOS or Android app into this data stream and um, as a, like a, a separate digital property. So for example, imagine if you have a if you have like multiple websites, so for example, I have my personal blog, and then I might also have another blog uh, hosted on different domain. I can put two blogs into one different data, one data stream, and then I can combine multiple websites into one. So this is very useful for clients with, uh, you know, like multiple websites. Say for example, a client may have a website in Singapore and in Thailand, they can now combine these two websites into one data stream if they want to track these two together. So this is very useful. And then uh, especially this is very useful if you want to combine multiple digital properties, right? So if you have a, if you're a, uh, a typical website, a, a typical client who has the uh, website, 
Android app, iOS app. Now you can combine everything into one data stream. And then based on that, you will be able to see the user going through all these different digital properties uh, into one reporting view. Um, so it's not possible to do a current Google Analytics data model because it's always separate, right? You have your Google Analytics for web and then you have your Firebase for the app. So this new concept of data stream is especially very helpful uh, when you want to consolidate everything into one single reporting property. So that's the first point. And the second point is the uh, automatic measurement. So what I mean by automatic measurement is that uh, Atlas Web bringing a lot of like pre-built measurement model. So it is uh, more flexible. Like, as I mentioned, they use the event-based tracking model. So, and then when you set up an Atlas Web uh, property uh, today, what will happen is that they offer something called enhanced measurement. So things like uh, scroll tracking, uh, download tracking, uh, video engagement tracking. Normally, if you have a website and then you want to track something like this, uh, you will probably have to set up something in GTN, do like something like custom JavaScript to track the uh, video plays or like find downloads or like scroll tracking. So there are a lot of additional steps involved when you want to track on a website. Uh, similarly for the app, right? If you want to track something on the app, you will have to set up something like this. But with App Plus Web, uh, Google offers all, all of these out of box. So you just have to like uh, switch it on. And then once you switch it on, then App Plus, and then when you have the uh, App Plus Web tracking on your website and the app, you will start seeing the data uh, straight away. Uh, you don't have to do anything. So this is very, this is great. So you don't have to worry about uh, how many people, how my video, how many engagement does my video get on my website on the app. So App Plus Web will generate this report for you. This is great. But then, of course, if you want to track your own custom events, so some of the clients have like additional custom events that they want to track, then of course that you need to stay set up like your own data layer or like Firebase event tracking in your apps. And of course, that all these uh, new measurements they also bring in new metrics. So uh, there is, there are no more like uh, metrics related to web as as we can call it like web metadata metrics like bounce rate, um, etc. They are not there anymore because. If you, if you think about it, bounce rate is more relevant for the website, but there is no concept about bounce rate in the app, right? So the user cannot go into the app and bounce. So they bring in additional metrics, which I think are very useful. So one is the engaged session. So how Google measure this engaged session is that people who has been on the site or the app for like last 10 seconds, they will consider as one engaged session. And then of course, then they have the engagement rate and engagement time. So engagement time is especially useful if you are, uh, if you are an app because uh, it attract the people who are still using the app, like you know, like in the foreground. Which means that, say for example, if you have a website, the user is still uh, actively focusing and reading on your website, and then uh, it's not tracking the if, for example, if the user switch to another tab and your website stay in the background, it will not keep tracking that. So this is very, these are very useful metrics. And then um, uh, we we have some clients already using some of the metrics to optimize for their website and website content or app content. So these are very useful. And the third thing is the reporting identity. As you as you will see, uh, uh, this is how App Plus Web model work, right? So this is to understand the true customer journey with cross device insight. So as the name mentioned, App Plus Web. Uh, so the main, uh, I would say, joint key to track the user consistently across website and app is Google use something called user ID. So for example, if you are a website like say Mac Delivery, right? So you have your Mac Delivery website and Mac Delivery apps. So on both website and the app, you can log in and then you have the user ID from the users. So the user ID is the joint key to keep tracking the same user across uh, apps and the website. So if you don't have the user ID on your website and the app, Google still use something called Google Signal. So this relies on all these signals such as uh, whether the user has logged into your, log into his or her Google account on his device, et cetera. And then based on the, how Google understand the user, they will still Try to like join the users across website and app. And if you have switched off Google signals in your data collection, and then Google will use something called device ID. So device ID is the last result. So if Google will try to understand whether the user is the same user based on his device ID and then based on the proximity of the devices. So these are the three level of uh, I would say keys that Google Google App Plus Web use to understand the user and then join the user across web and app. And then based on these. Uh, uh, what you can now be able to see is that you will be able to understand what the users are actually doing on your website and the app and how they're using uh, devices uh, like 
across, right? So sometimes you may use the website on the morning and then in the evening, they may switch on to mobile. So this is where you were trying to understand. And then if you are a marketing, marketing person, you can try to reach out to people on the relevant time on relevant devices based on the Atlas Web um, Insights. And yeah, of course, when you set up for the Atlas Web, this is what uh, Google normally asks. So first thing is like whether you want to use the user ID and device or whether you want to identify the user by the device. So this is really good because normally this is not possible to do with current Google Analytics data model. So Google in Google Analytics uh, current model, you have something called user ID reporting view. But even then, that user ID reporting view only works for the website, but not for the apps. But across uh, with uh, Appless Web, it works across your website and the app at the same time. And that brings me to the uh, next uh, point, which is the Analysis Hub. So Analysis Hub is really awesome. I really like it because like, if you are on Appless Web, this is where they are located. So you can go all the way down there and you will be able to see a lot more reports. So first thing I really like about this report is that um, these are not available, say, if you are using a uh, free GA. Uh, standard, standard GA version, right? Standard GA version, you can only build like custom reports, etc. But then, if you want to uh, go deep to uh, dig deeper into your data, you have to like go uh, premium, which is GSD. But uh, with App Plus Web, you can get all these kind of, uh, I would say, premium reports for free. And then I will be walking through like what each report uh, does. So first is like a analysis report, right? So these are like a number of reports that you can do inside App Plus Web. So there are different a couple of reports that you can play around with uh, today, mostly around exploration, funnels, segment overlaps, and part analysis. <clears throat> so first is the exploration. Um, I normally think of this report as like a, a quick way to understand your data. Like if you have set up something and then you want to understand how your setup has been going well. And then of course, if you want to run a campaign before that, you want to understand how many users that you have, uh, or like you can even like build something like paper table or like pie charts in the, inside there. So it's really simple to use because all you have to do is that you have to, as, as you can see from the GIF here, you can just drag and drop the dimensions and metrics that you want to uh, see in the report. And based on that, uh, Atlas will, will generate the report for you. And then you can easily share this report with your team and then uh, show them what you see so far. And then you can export the report into you know, like CSV or PDF and then you can share with the wider team as well. So this is really great because this is this allows you to easily understand what's going on with your data. And then the, another favorite part of uh, analysis hub is uh, finance report. So as you as you will recall, like uh, with GA standard, you won't be able to build this kind of custom funnel previously. So you will be able to build funnels if you are tracking the uh, URL goal with the funnel. So you have your goal funnel. But apart from that, if you want to build your own funnel, it's really hard to do so. But with App Plus Web, it's really simple. Uh, as you can see from here, you can just drag and drop um, the uh, metrics and then dimension. And then from there, and it's also useful because if you are, say, if you have an app and then you want to understand what people are doing inside the app, you can still use the funnel analysis to understand, say, for example, starting from the uh, registration screen all the way to the, uh, say, uh, account sign up part of the people doing behind, between the steps. So you can easily create uh, steps inside funnel analysis and then see where people are dropping off. And then where they are dropping off, you can even bring in additional dimension. Like for example, if you are analyzing app plus web behavior, you can even bring in like device uh, category or like device uh, browser information to understand which browser or which device the user may be facing some issues with signing up. So this is really great. And then the part thing, uh, part thing is also like, I would say improvement on uh, current GA uh, behavior flow report. So if you are using a like GA, uh, you, will, you will recall that there is a behavior reporting report where you will be able to understand what the users are actually doing on the site. Um, so you'll be able to see that like, where people are going from one step to another. But part analysis report uh, enhance this kind of behavior reporting by bringing, uh, allowing you to bring in like additional dimensions and allowing you to be more flexible in a way that now you can even bring in like, for example, you don't even need to like just uh, analyze the uh, page view metric, but you can also bring in uh, uh, metrics like session start. So starting from where people started the session on your website, on the app, and then to see what type of page that they view next or like what type of event that they do next. So you can even bring in a lot of stuff like that and to be really able to understand what people are doing on your website on the app. So these reports are actually very great. Um, and then uh, of course, like if you, if you have more data, you're gonna play around with it. And then if you are using Atlas Web for 
like different digital properties like website and an app uh, is very, very powerful for you. And then it's all available for you to treat, right? And then uh, another favorite part of mine is the uh, sampling. So if you are using GA standard, uh, you may not normally face this issue where you suddenly uh, want to analyze something and then GA will say that you cannot because it uh, there is a limit that Google Analytics set when you reach certain limit, right? So and understand that if you reach, if you are analyzing data for a certain date range and then you reach over 500k sessions at a property level, it will start sampling. So essentially it means that it will not return 100% of the data that you want to see. So what happens is that if you're using GA360, uh, that is fine, you can download the ensemble report. But if you're using GA standard, uh, what tend to happen is that you, you still have to like shorten your day range and trying to overcome this sampling limit because uh, say imagine you, you don't want to make decisions based on 10% of your data, right? So you want to make decisions based on 100% of data confidently so that you will be able to achieve what you want. So this is like very, very uh, challenging especially if you are a website with a lot of like page views, a lot of sessions, and then you still have like want to overcome that limit. So great news about App Labs Web is that there is no sampling limit. Um, from what we can see so far, uh, as of September 20, uh, just to put a caveat. Uh, so in standard reports, as you can see on the uh, on the side, these are unsampled all the time. So you can go into any of the report uh, today, uh, play around with the day range, uh, it will return 100% of data without sampling, right? So that's great. And then if you are on Analysis Hub, like I mentioned earlier, so in this Analysis Hub, uh, you can pay your own custom reports analysis session. So uh, from what we've seen so far, if you go over to 10 million events limit hit, there could be some sampling. Um, but other than that, most of the time, if you are not exceeding the limit, it's uh, always assembled, which is great because now that if you want to just pull out like a simple report uh, with like say for example page report something like that you'll be able to do so without going through the sampling issue right so that's all great so far and then i uh people you always tend to ask like uh what about next right it's like what's the next because sometimes you may you don't want to always see the data in your ui like user interface you want to like dig deeper into data so how can we go about it right so this is the bonus point that big career expo so as of today, uh, there is a free BigQuery link in available for Apple Web property. So what it actually means is that you can now be able to export your raw data into BigQuery, which is the, uh, uh, I would say, data warehouse sitting inside Google Cloud. And then based on that, uh, based, of course, you, have, you still have to pay for like some storage uh, cost, but it's normally very cheap. But it's not possible previously if you're using, say, uh, free uh, standard GA, because BigQuery Expo is only available for uh, GA360. So this is a really good point. Like it's a free product, but then it allows you to export your raw data into BigQuery. So that actually enables you to dig deeper into your, you know, like, uh, your raw data and then be able to understand more into what the customers are doing and then be able to like dig deeper into um, you know, like what the people are doing on say app on the website. So this is a really, really good uh, finding uh, that we have. So yeah, so then as a next step, should you migrate to App Plus Web? So we have a couple of checklists here. So first thing is that if you have a website and then if you have an app with login functionality, so essentially you are something like a McDonald's delivery again. So you have a website and an app, and if you want to track the user, yes, you should use App Plus Web so that you can see a single customer journey view across web and app. But let's say, for example, say like if you say, I only have a website. I don't even have the like, uh, login functionality and I don't have the app, right? Should you still use it? Yes, because Appless will actually offer premium features like I explained through like all the analysis hub, BigQuery Expo, uh, much better features uh, that is, uh, than is available in uh, GA standard. So you should, you should already start migrating into Appless web so that uh, you will be able to start utilizing all these uh, awesome features uh, straight away. And then if you see like, what if you are using like GA and Firebase already, right? So you already have a GA on your website and you already have a Firebase on the app. Yes, you, you can still use Apple as well. So what we normally recommend to the client is that if you can keep your existing uh, GA and Firebase implementation as of, as it is now, and then you should do a tag. So do a tag means that any event or any page view that you have been tagging for the website and Firebase so far, you should also tag these to send the data into Apple as well property so that, uh, so that your data will be sending the data, uh, so your website will be sending the data to Appless property 
uh, same thing, your app will be sending data to Ableton property. And then inside that Ableton property, that you'll be able to analyze the user across, you know, like website and the app, and then you will be able to dig, um, dig deeper into like cross device and size and so on. So of course, Ableton Web is a beta. So um, there are like some limitations that we found so far. Um, so there are something like we found like as of today, we don't see like uh, there's no dedicated page views or screen view report uh, as you would normally have in GA standard. Uh, you won't be, you are not able to like upload the data into Ableton Web yet. And then of course, like one thing uh, the clients <laughs> request is like, how can we create like reporting view for different reporting purposes? So for example, you want you might want to have a raw data reporting view versus filter reporting view for different reporting uh, purposes, but you won't be able to do it in App Plus Web at the moment. All you have is the one single property, and then every data will flow into that property without being able to like further, uh, I would say, filter out the traffic like that you want to see, right? And then of course that, that brings the next point where you won't be able to manipulate the data using filters as you can you are able to do with GA standard right now. Like for example, you won't be able to exclude your internet traffic, or like you won't be able to like lower case or change some filters, uh, some chain data around that. And uh, there, um, also about like uh, the reporting UI has some limit, uh, some uh, limitation around the uh, how many event parameters that you can see on the uh, uh, on the interface. So there is no dedicated event report that you can just go inside and then uh, browse around. So there are some limitations around there. And then no channel grouping. So all the traffic source that you see are just like source BDM, so on. And then so far, I don't see the uh, uh, product level scope, custom dimensions or metrics that you can bring in to understand deep, uh, more about how the users are playing with the uh, app and web. But this hopefully will come soon. So yeah, a couple of takeaways and just to recap. So uh, I would like to reiterate that it's a very exciting product launch from Google. And then uh, it also brings in a lot of premium features uh, for a like free and beta product. And then uh, if you are already using GA and Firebase, you should be tagging together uh, Apple Web uh, tags on your on top of your implementation. And then of course, uh, given in mind that it is still a beta product, it brings in uh, it, it, Google will keep uh, continuity uh, to update the features along the way. And then of course. Uh, that it still keep coming in. And then recently they, not, they announced that they, they launched the uh, App Plus Web connector to Data Studio, which is great. So that now you can bring App Plus Web data into Data Studio and do visualization. So every week there's gonna be a new announcement on Google focusing on App Plus Web. So uh, what I recommend is that get your hands on right on it um, and then play around with it and see what you think. Of course, like uh, this is not like comprehensive list of, of learning. Uh, there are a lot more learnings that we found, but in the interest of time, uh, these are the, uh, I would say, top key findings that we learn from um, playing around with App Plus Web. So as usual, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or you know do my email here, and then I'm happy to take any questions that you have so far. Thank you. Wonderful, Zinko. Thank you for that session. It was a good you know run through of what has come up new in App Plus Web property in GA. Uh, so far, we've had a couple of questions in both from DOS team. Uh, sure. First one is more on, you know, the cookie-less approach that the browsers are taking now. Uh, yeah. Is, you know, is this uh, app plus web property and the way it thinks web as an app as well, is this a response to that cookie-less world? Yeah, that's a really great question. Yes. So this is like, I would say, uh, somehow uh, response to cookie-less uh, tracking in a way that you are not, we are not relying on cookies anymore. We are relying on user ID and Google signals, right? So even though like uh, if you have a user, um, say login functionality, you should be still able to track the user across website and app. So this is in response to, I would say a cookie less tracking where the browser may, may, bro may block your Google Analytics cookie where if you have a app plus web, uh, you will still be able to track the same user with the user ID. And then, of course, there are other tools available from Google, like server, I would say server site tagging, or like server site tagging with GTM, which is like an, another exciting launch. <laughs> so these are like new tools available um, coming out every month. Um, and then these are, I would say, like some response to the uh, Google list trick. Got it, got it. Thank you, Zinko. And second one is like uh, more from me on implementation, Zinko. Uh, will Firebase yes. SDK <laughs> cover uh, cover the tracking in app or does App Plus Web property as a separate SDK that has to be uh, integrated? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's really a good point. So uh, currently, you can do two ways. So for example, mm -hmm. if if you you don't have a Firebase in your app, and then you want to start with App Plus Plus straight away, what will happen is that if you create an App Plus Plus property, or like even you create, uh, say you go to Google Analytics and you, mm -hmm. you go and create like the property to track your app, App Plus Web will create uh, in the background a Firebase project for you. So, uh, and then App Plus Web will ask you to download an SDK into your app to be able to track your uh, app behavior. So it's kind of like a Firebase, but then I, right. all you see is the app, app Plus Web, but in the background, they already create a Firebase project for you. But say, if you already have a Firebase project, what you can do is that you can link your Firebase project into your App Plus Web, uh, sorry, App Plus Web property so that you will be able to link your Firebase data with your App Plus Web. And then, of course, uh, it's always easier you use GTM, right? If you use GTM in your app and your website, all you have to do is that uh, grab the, uh, that measurement ID from your App Plus Web property, put it in your uh, apps as the uh, uh, App Plus Web tag. And then based on that, you will be able to send data into App Plus Web property from your uh, apps. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you, Zinko. No worries. Uh, yeah, I think... Those were the questions we had in both of our DOS team. So uh, uh, no vouchers for us, sadly. But but still, uh, I think given uh, the time, I can still give you some <laughs> as well. Yeah, <laughs> let's uh, let's move on to the next session, Zinko. Thank you for your time. Very useful, no wonderful session. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Awesome. So next we have. Uh, Sabrina from AB Tasty. Uh, Hello. Do you know demonstrate how how easy it is to set up an AB test through their platform? Like AB test, uh, Sabrina, as you might know, uh, can run into low, medium, and high complexity tests, right? And it depends on the use case you're trying to personalize. So yeah, looking forward to see how easy it is to set up an AB test through AB Tasty sure. platform. Over to okay. you. Thank you, Hari. Thanks for having me today as well. And uh, thank you to everybody who's still watching now. I see there's still like about 40 people plus on the, oh, I shouldn't say that, but like quite a lot of people still on the stream. So um, basically, yeah, um, I'm Sabrina and I'm a customer success manager for ABTST's clients in the APEC region. Um, I'm currently working with brands such as Kelvin Klein, Decathlon, and FWD. Uh, so it's anywhere between like um, from e-commerce to lead generation uh, sites, media sites as well, and charities to improve their on-site ROI through A-B AB testing and personalization with the ABTC platform. So basically the question that we tackle is, once we've managed to acquire our visitors, you know, be it through like ads or SEO or whatnot, um, and then get them to our site, what can we do to then get them to move down the funnel and actually make a transaction? So we believe that the, way, the best way to do so is by optimizing our, your customer experience through testing and personalization, just like what Amazon does. So as a company, ABTC was established in Paris about 10 years ago, um, where they work globally with LVMH and L'Oreal brands uh, and amongst others. Our APEC office was set up in Singapore just two years ago and we have offices in New York, SF and across Europe. So now coming back to the platform, um, I have maybe like 14 minutes now to share this with you. I'll be sharing or showing you how to set up your audience segments for personalization. So we've talked a lot about that earlier. Um, I'll also show, show you how to create variations very easily for testing or also for personalization using our editor and also to review the results uh, to, quickly understand how, to quickly understand how your tests are performing. So, all right, uh, let's get started with the demo. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, I hope. You can say yes if you can see my screen. That'd be great. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah? Okay, great. So here we are at the, um, the dashboard. So welcome, Sabrina, myself, and welcome, everyone. So here you'll get an overview of the tests and personalizations that you're currently running. And you're able to start, stop your, start and stop your tests and also get them organized. So you can see here that we have folders. Um, you can you know, search for the test that you're running. So all of that, uh, you can see all your archive tests once you've done, you're done running them. And you can see how many tests are running, currently running, 
Um, and over here, you would eventually be able to see the uplift in ROI with, that you've had with AB Tasty. So when you look at the top here, this is basically like an overview of what all the things that you can do with ABTC. That's a lot of things. So you can run your tests, personalizations as well. So these two kind of look the same. It's just a dashboard. And then you're able to build your audience. That's a dedicated section to build your segments um, and your audiences. And then we also have an insights tool. So obviously, you know, we're, we're always talking about where the test ideas come from. And a lot of these usually come from insights that we get from our customers. So we have our NPS score survey that you can run. We also have session recordings and you're also able to explore your data to understand um, better how your customers are engaging with your site. And then we have like actually more stuff, but I won't go into that today. So, okay, so uh, let's move into the audience dash. Oh, yeah, let's move into the audience dashboard first. So I've already preloaded pre this. Uh, so basically over here, you can see an overview of, you know, all the different, different types of audience you have. Um, there's an overview of like how much traffic share uh, a particular audience has, um, how much of the transaction rate, the, uh, what their transaction rate is, and whether they're, act they're active or not, or whether they're currently affected to a test or not. So you can actually create a new segment very, very easily. So all of this information that we collect is actually from, um, you know, once you actually add the ABTC tag into your site or through GTM, um, we start collecting all these all this data anonymously, um, and this is all the information that you can actually tap on to customize or to target your audience. So there's some very basic things like, okay, you know, maybe we want to target a new or returning visitor. So let's customize something for the re returning visitor. And maybe we want to pick customers only from mobile devices. And we also have a couple of interesting things like um, engagement level. So this one is AI powered and um, there's quite a lot of, I mean, there's, there's a few things that we take into account, but basically we segment your customers or your visitors automatically by loyal, valuable, all the way to disengage visitors. And this is quite interesting. Um, and the other thing that we have is also the content interest segmentation. So this is actually segmented by the different types of keywords um, available in the, various con uh, in the various titles of your site. So this is all from the, the title meta text. All right, so uh, we won't use this right now, but I'll just show you. Yeah, I can just save returning mobile visitors and save. It's really easy. And this will actually save your audience under the, or this segment under the audience tab. So that's one way to, you know, have your segment on ABTC. One other way is that we also have um, in native integrations with DMP CRM tools. So you can see here that you can actually um, connect to tools like your Ad Adobe Audience Manager as well as your Telium Audience Stream. And this is actually really easy to activate if you already have it. You can just sign into your account or you just have to provide your yeah, account name and profile name for Telium. And we have a bunch of others as well. We also have your Google Analytics as Zin shared earlier. Um, we're able to actually send all the information that's coming through or passing through ABTC into your web analytics tools if you wish to analyze it from there. But we also have a reporting feature, which I'll show you a bit later. So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask and you may win a, a voucher. <laughs> all right. So um, this is where the magic begins. Um, oh, part of the magic. And this is our what you see is what you get editor. And it's literally what you see is what you get, right? So if you've used any um, you know, CMS like Wix or Squarespace, it works pretty much in a very similar fashion. So when you hover over, say, a website, right? So over here, I'm using Redmart because I'm assuming that you know, all of us have been very acquainted with grocery shopping in the recent times online. So um, here you can see that when I hover over an element, you know, like it, it really mimics your HTML, um, HTML um, 
document here, you're able to make changes to a lot of things. So here I can actually you know, hide an element. I've hidden all the banners now, it's gone. I can also take away, oops, take away the search function. I can change headlines. Let's see, or maybe not. I can change the style as well, yes. Let's change the headline. Other people bought something like that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, what you want to make sure, what you want to find out is, you know, by making the changes um, that you've done, whether this actually converts to, you know, actual increases or maybe even a decrease in conversion rate, right? So, um, yeah, so there's other things that you can do as well, like sorting the categories. So this is also a sort function. And there's a lot of other functions within our editor that you can play around with and basically build uh, different customizations or different variations within um, to test or to personalize the experience for your customers. So now that we're looking at the mobile version, um, mobile view, it's also possible to view in desktop mode. Um, unfortunately, I won't be showing it to you right now because it will take a little bit of time. But the other really, really, really cool thing that we have is our widgets function, which is actually our widget library, which is a set of pre-coded templates that a lot of our marketing and e-commerce users um, are very happy to, to actually use because we have things like you know, the countdown banner, um, we have tooltips, we have pop-ups, as well as a progress bar that a lot of our e-commerce clients use. Um, and these are really, really helpful when it comes to like promotion or sales periods. So I'll just show you like a, an example of a countdown banner. So you can create something like this. This is a default, but you can create other things as well um, and modify it based on however you like. As you can see here, we also have like more, um, more advanced tools. Like um, you can actually add your own CSS and JavaScript. Um, so on and so forth, if you actually have someone who can develop or code on your team. So moving down the different steps when it comes to building a test, there's uh, you know, obviously a few steps before you, want to, before you actually launch a test. And the main part is actually to measure how well the test is going. So the next step is actually your goals. We, ABTC makes setting up your goals really, really easy. So you're actually able to see you know, um, what um, clicks you're tracking here. So here, for example, I've actually preset uh, clicks on categories as an action tracking. You can also set up page trackings as a uh, goal. You can actually add them here on the right. And then you can also create custom trackings through code. There's also these browsing metrics that are here native that you can track as well as your transaction goal. So of course, we always want to know whether like a certain change has made an impact on the bottom line, right? But depending on where you are in the funnel uh, or on your website, you'll want to pick very like more relevant goals for a, partic a particular test that you're running. All right, so the next part is step four, targeting, and you're able to actually, um, yeah, uh, define the, the parameters in which your campaign that you've just set up will run. So first of all, uh, who will see the test? This is where you find your, your segments that you've created. So here maybe, I know just now we've created like returning people, but it's okay, you can just pick this one for now. Um, you can also choose or specify the URLs which you want to display, where you want to display the test. You can also choose how to trigger the test. So this part is really interesting when it comes to personalizing the customer experience. So there's a lot of different triggers that we have. Um, some of them I think that might be interesting would be maybe your landing page. So you can target visitors who have entered the site on a specific page. So like, you know, when you want to link this to a marketing um, activation, like, you know, your, your, with your UTM codes and all that, um, this is where you do it, or this is how you do it. So you can actually say like, okay, my, my landing page will contain a certain parameter. Um, you can also, yeah, you can even um, link 
uh, AB Tasty to your Google Tag Manager data layer. So this is also possible. You can just add the key and value over here. You make it all really, really simple for you. And so on, so on and so forth. All right. And this is where you can like just QA and check the test. And then finally, um, there's obviously the very important part of the traffic allocation. So this is where you decide how much of your traffic is actually allocated to your variations. So in this case, I actually had created two variations. So you can see here variation one, variation two. But this is where I show you the countdown. Um, I can actually change the way that the traffic is allocated. So typically, we will always have equal share between um, original and the variations when we are running a test. So this is how we set up a test in, what was that, 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, so this is, again, another place to uh, link up your third-party integrations. So you can you know, link up Amplitude, Google Analytics, Mixpanel, and whatnot. And yes, so finally, um, just to round off the session, I wanted to show you how our reporting looks like and how it works. So you can see here, um, this, in this test, we had three different variations versus the original, right? So you can see that 14,000 over people um, viewed this test. And here you can see which one is the best performer, variation one. And this is the gain probability, which shows that, yes, we are 100% confident of a gain in, in this variation. However, in, in variation two, we're very, very sure that there's no gain. So you can also see here that, you know, how the action tracking um, metric looks like, bounce rate, as well as transaction rate, all of this. And finally, you'll see that you're, you're able to filter all the information by device, by date, by all of these um, different criteria that really, really helps you identify um, segments that are performing differently or be behave, um, behaving differently compared to your main um, overall audience. So at the end of the day, it's really about having a you know, continuous optimization process. And we always encourage our customers to, or clients to test before they personalize so that they can make sure that the personalizations actually work for the segments that they are targeting. Yeah. All right, so I think we're done. <laughs> Perfect, Sabrina. On time, I think, like, right on time. Uh, yeah, you told me that was going to be a timer, man. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was on. I, I did actually check with the team as well. It was on. Uh, that was wonderful session. Like you covered right from uh, how do you use data, then how do you set up with the targeting audiences. Uh, you use the visual editor. So there are a lot of questions. Um, Oof. Yeah, yeah six I, to, I can... up to six questions already. So let's start going through them. Uh, Yes. First sure. one is from DOS Team exactly. Shiyun. Uh, what are the data sources that can be connected to AB Tasty? Right? Can we okay. incorporate our own uh, data segments like lifetime value segments into it? Right. So I think it depends. I think I, I covered a little bit about the data sources. So we have some integrations already. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, I think maybe a good question, a question that I'll like kind of, I'll just rephrase the question in the sense that. Um, the data that ABTC collects is actually store, is actually from the two first-party cookies that we store in the browser. Mm -hmm. So for non-Apple um, browsers or non-Safari browsers, we are able to collect the information from the cookies, but then from Safari, it's actually from your local storage. So we're able to get data from data based off like browsing history, um, the, their geolocation, if they're not on a, on a VPN, obviously, um, mm. you know, what mobile they're on, um, how many times they visited, visited the site, what's, how many sessions, whether they've transacted or not, all of that. Yeah. Can, can, we also import, know, yeah. can we import data, Sabrina? Maybe that's the uh, question. Can uh, we import no, data? There's no. no way to like import data, like, yeah, unless, we can link up to an API or something. So there are, I mean, it depends. It depends on, on what the case is. Yeah. Understood, right. Mm. Uh, next one is also an audience-based, a similar um, question. When you took mm. through, you know, you showed uh, loyal customers uh, yes. uh, fly. Yeah. That's the engagement level. 
Yeah. So is that what it's it's black box? Is it a black box or is it something the customer? When we so we recently rolled it out and it was initially a black box to me. Okay, but it is not. So um so basically uh the algorithm works on okay there's a there's a lot there's like thirteen different things that we take into account. Um, like bounce rate and like whether they've transacted or not, how many sessions, how many sessions they've they've uh, um, viewed your site. But basically, what happens is that we always to to I, to better understand um, how AB Tasty classifies the four different segments. Mm-hmm. What we do is that we actually build the segment under our audience builder, and then that actually identifies. Um, what percentage of our traffic uh, is actually from that audience, and what and how much do they actually transact? Yeah, so we run kind of like we are able to create these segments within the audience, which will then show us the traffic traffic share and each segment's transaction rate. But we can also get in, get more granular by creating AA tests for each individual segment to really, really understand how each segment is behaving with your site. Yeah. So it's not a black box. We can actually- Right, right. Okay, got it. Uh, third question is from Sean. Uh, does this apply to both organic and paid media? I think his question is more on the channel um, that refers uh, to the website. The ch- uh, I think it's more for the website for itself, targeting, right? right? It, yeah, irrespective of the channel. Um, yeah, I think so. Basically, AB Tasty, uh, when it comes to like defining our target URLs, we can we do work with both organic and paid media. So, typically, paid media will always have some kind of parameter to to kind of check um, mm-hmm. you know, where your source, where your well, where your visitors are coming from, right? So you can actually target by um, paid media. So what our clients have done is that they've actually, um, I can, can I say who? Yeah, maybe one of our insurance clients has actually um, um, used their paid, me- paid media to personalize their landing pages for the various uh, promotions that they're running on SEM. Yeah, so right. that's one way that they do it. And they also do it for email uh, blasts as well. So they can also customize the email landing pages based on mm. where um, customers are coming from. Got yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, next question is from Sean as well on the same line. So do you have control over, you know, uh, identifying the user across channel to stop contamination? Like you don't, you don't mm. put a user in variation A for one channel and the same user in variation B. Another yes. Channel. So okay. So typically, um, the way that ABTC allocates the various tests is that the one, the test that was created first, and it, the test that was created first will be given highest priority. And if the audience is, if the audience matches the criteria of the first test, it will just see that one, and that's it. Right. Um, but at the same time, we always advise our clients to you know, keep track of who they are targeting with which, which tests. So mm-hmm. there's no cross contamination. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, so behind the scenes, right? Behind ABTC, there's a lot of organization that's, uh, that's actually being done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fifth question is from Yakita. Can we test entirely different variants of a page? Like, not just hmm. elements like what Ooh, you show, can it yes. be an entire variation of a page? Yes, yes, yes. So we actually call that a redirection test. Right. So we have, um, this is quite of, uh, often the case mm. where clients want to find out whether maybe a brand new homepage will you know, bring about higher conversions or they might want to s- test a specific um, change in product page layout. Yeah, so we can run redirection tests and to actually set, th- to set those up, it's very, very easy. It takes like half an hour. So yeah, we can do it. <laughs> All right. um, sixth, uh, last but first question is from Zinko, our other speaker. Uh, is the visual mm. editor applicable only for desktop or is it also applicable for mobile apps? Okay, so this is a good question because um, the visual editor is for... So right now, ABT, so ABTC as a company, we actually have two different products. So ABTC... Mm-hmm. 
um, we are actually dealing with front end modifications for websites. Right. Okay. But then we have another, um, another product called flagship. So flagship actually deals with mobile apps as well as, as back end um, testing. So we have a separate product that That's deals with uh, mobile apps. The server side. Uh, yeah, server product, side. Right? It's server side. Right. So ABTC is only client side. Right. And yeah. uh, in terms of segments, so segments that are created in Google Analytics, for example, can that be pushed to AB Testy for targeting or should mm. you create the segment again in AB Testy? Uh, yeah. So the thing about GA is that, or Google in general, is that they, they don't really allow us to to get any information out of GA. So that's why it's only a one-way integration right now. We can only send ABTC data to, uh, to Google. So what we typically do is that we actually end up rebuilding the, the segments in ABTC. Um, yeah, that's, that's really how we do it for, for this, in this case. Yeah. Got it. Thank you, sir. Last question yeah. from Alvin. Uh, can you do 100% traffic allocation and use it just for personalization and not AB? Can I do 100% allocation? Like, can it be 100% oh, oh, allocation okay, to okay, say okay, the yes, challenger yes, got it. variation B? Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, so you can. Uh, so as I showed, as I mentioned briefly just now, we have a testing and personalization dashboard, right? So I just took you through the testing process, but in the personalization version, um, you can actually just send 100% to, to one variation. So it is possible. Yes. It's possible, right. We can do it. This, yeah. And uh, what about emails for A-B testing? Same from uh, So we only work with uh, websites. So once people are on the website, then we, that's where we you know, do the A-B test. So unfortunately, we don't have anything to do with, it, with email at the moment. Yeah. Got it. Those are the questions, Sab. So, uh, oh, okay. Given you know, uh, for the second session, voucher is also there. You could actually get to select. Two, I can give away uh, like like this. Two <laughs> just two. Maybe just twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, I would give it. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, oh, okay. I think Yakita asked a good question because. I actually forgot to mention that. So mm -hmm. good one okay. about redirection tests. Right. And the other one I liked was actually um, Supra Blue because you asked about the engagement level feature. Mm -hmm. um, that one is something that's actually pretty new. We just rolled it out last month and we we're very excited about that. So it was good for me to also like talk it through and it was good to share about it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Sabrina. Thanks for your Alrighty. time. Uh, very interesting and engaging session, right? Looking at the number of questions as well. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad. I'm glad it was cool. uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Let's... And also, wait, wait, like, let me plug. Yeah, yeah, so if you yeah. want to uh, get in touch, right, uh, you can drop me an email or on, you can drop me an email at sabrina.we at abtc.com or you can link up with me on LinkedIn. Just perfect. Sabrina yeah. Wee. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Thank you, Sabrina. That, that's you time much, for Sabrina. a wrap. So before we wrap up, uh, you know, thanks to our sponsors, um, Happy Marketeer, Tishin Signs, and Eclux, without whom this would not be possible. We've been running this event this year online, and they've been continuously supporting us. Uh, and then thanks to our speakers and the companies that they are from taking time out to share what they're doing on day to day and sharing with our community. Thanks to the audience, like being at remote, uh, thank you for tuning in and joining us through the live stream. And yeah, do subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll get notifications when the videos are uploaded. right? And you can also get notifications when these live sessions go uh, up on air. right? And also join our LinkedIn group. So we have created a LinkedIn uh, page as well for you to join and we'll keep you uh, updated over there. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thanks again for a wonderful session. Uh, We'll connect with you again on the next month's session. Thank you all. Have a, have a great evening.